Arya has this piece of very incriminating evidence against Sansa. So she goes looking for it and she doesn't find it, but she finds a bag full of severed faces instead, which is creepy. And then her sister appearing without any sounds creepier still. Not what you're looking for. And as they get into the discussion about what these faces are, she starts to see Arya as a real physical danger to her. The game of faces didn't turn out so well for the last person who asked me questions. Tell me what they are. Going into the final episode, I think Sansa is bringing with her a real fear about the idea that Arya might really want to murder her. It's a fear that Littlefinger expertly stokes. Is that what she thinks? I don't know what she thinks. I don't know her anymore. We knew that if we were going to send them north, to have them trudging across snow-filled landscapes would take you so far, especially once there's a big zombie polar bear in the middle of it. At a certain point, you have to find the army of the dead. We were thinking, how can you possibly survive that situation? That was the thing that was the hardest for us. We came gradually to the idea that the one way they might survive is to be in the middle of an island. And then you put five or 10,000 whites on that ice coming after them, that that might believably be something that would break the ice in a way that they didn't. At a certain point, they're just fighting for their survival. Once they retreat all the way to the middle of the lake, there's nowhere farther to run. She's always been willing to risk her life to do what she thinks is right. And in terms of going north to rescue them, a number of people up there have different claims on her heart. You know, Jorah's been by her side from the beginning, and he saved her life so many times, I think she would feel as if it was a betrayal if she didn't at least try to save him. And then, of course, there's Jon Snow. You definitely get the sense that he's become quite important to her in a pretty short amount of time. He sees that they're all going to die if the dragon doesn't take off. The rational decision at that point is you guys go to safety, and I'll try to keep them off you as long as I can. He's the guy who jumps on the grenade to save the rest of the platoon. That's always been John. The thing with cold hands is it all has to somehow work in a pretty compressed time frame because there just isn't time. We need the emotional connection. Cold hands has to somehow convince him very quickly to do what I say, and the easiest way for him to do that is to show his face. Uncle Benji. John kind of has to respect the decision because he just did the same thing. For Cold Hands, I think it's almost a relief in some ways because he's been trapped in this kind of purgatory state between life and death for quite some time. And like so many of the characters in the show waiting to find out what his purpose is, you know, why is he still alive when he should be dead? And for him, it seems like he's found his purpose in these last two seasons by saving first Bran and now John. I think that when she sees him return on the back of Coldhand's horse, that's a big moment for her in terms of the way she feels about him. I don't think either one of them really knew exactly how powerful their feelings were towards each other until these moments. Just the notion of falling for someone, that involves weakness. It's not something a queen does, but she feels that happening, and he feels it happening for her. I'm sorry. I think both of them are on kind of unfamiliar ground, and especially because it's with an equal. It's kind of hard for her at that point, I think, not to look at this guy and realize that this is not like the other boys. The dragons are my children. They're the only children I'll ever have. Do you understand? The whole path of the show, in some way, had been trying to map out all the episode endpoints. And with this one, it was the dragon opening its blue eye and realizing that the Night King has finally gotten his own weapon of mass destruction. What was fun about the sequence, in an awful way to us, is that up until the end, it's very close to one of those battles where all the good guys get out the other side and more or less scot-free. But we knew that killing the dragon was going to have a tremendous emotional impact, because over the seasons and seasons of the show, it's really been emphasized what they are to Danny. We knew that the Night King would see and seize this opportunity. I like to think that when the dragon dies, that it's kind of a one-two punch, because on the one hand, you're just seeing the horror of one of these three amazing beings like this in the world going under the water and not coming up again and processing that. 
then you're processing something that's even worse, which is when it comes back out from under the water again, and we see in the last shot of the episode what it becomes.